Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to week four of New 302. Um, uh, and today, let me think, as you're getting this, ah, yes, today will be October the 1st. Um, so we have um, entered autumn, fall. Uh, I have to say that um, there is a special place for me. Oh, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, there is a special place uh, in my heart for, for autumn and fall. Um, obviously, you know, it's hard, hard to dislike summer. Um, so summer is wonderful, um, even under the strange conditions that we find ourselves. Um, but there's, there's just something about autumn that really hits me. I mean, it's perhaps telling that you know, uh, I went to school for years, and then during the whole time I wasn't a student, I hung around with students and spent time on campus, etc. And now I'm on campus, so of course, uh, you know, uh, autumn, September, and into autumn really is the new year for me, right? Um, for many of you, I suspect it's the same thing. If you've been a perpetual student, there is, of course, some attachment to the idea of January as a new year, but really, when does the year feel like it's starting fresh? September. And it really feels like it's sort of picking up pace once things start to cool down for me. So there's, there's a certain kind of charm, cyclic charm for me uh, in the fall, you know, long pants, come back out, becomes jacket season, scarves, sweaters, I like those things. Um, uh, you know, blustery winds. I was walking down the street yesterday and there was like a whole cascade of dry yellow leaves that came down off a tree and rained down to the street. Um, which was quite lovely and the smell was in the air and you know they cycle back shitty pumpkin spice products but there's actual pumpkins and Halloween I don't know how the hell they're going to do that this year but maybe we can do something on our time so the point is welcome to fall um, and as uh, is keeping I think with sort of October as a, as a general theme leading up to the 31st in Halloween this is the month when we're going to be uh, examining sort of you know, uh, more comprehensively the, the shadow. That's sort of our, our focus for the month. There's other stuff in there, but shadow is going to be in, in the main what I'm going to be talking about. Um, however, because there was only three weeks in September this year, I've still got um, this final lecture to, to tie up sort of overarching stuff, the final two lectures to tie up overarching stuff. So we're going to pick up some of the, you know, basic structure of the Jungian psyche we'll pick up today. And then also, uh, I will devote the second hour to talking about uh, functions and functions theory a bit. And that'll give us, you know, as I mentioned, sort of an overview. If we've gone through all this stuff, we're going to keep cycling through, circumambulating, as they say in the literature, we're going to keep cycling through. And we will keep touching on points and building in more complexity as we go. But I wanted to get this basic framework in place so that as we're looking at texts and getting people's presentations and stuff, we have something to hang that on. And then it will gradually complexify, okay? Um, uh, since you probably already heard it several times, and there it is again, I'll just mention that that is not a very slow metronome or an aggravated budgie, um, but rather is the uh, smoke alarm in my home, um, which they are coming around to uh, inspect at some point today, so it's possible I will get a, like a knock at the door and have to frantically pause or something, um, but they're supposed to be fixing. Um, it's driving me absolutely mad i have to i have to admit and hopefully it doesn't drive you mad as you hear it every i don't know how many seconds i haven't timed it but uh that'll be kicking in frequently so i do apologize for that um trust me it's considerably more acute for me than it is for you so hopefully we can both tolerate it for the duration today and if they don't fix it i'll, I'll just take a rubber mount and smash it off the ceiling and safety be damned i don't mean that i don't mean that safety is important <clears throat> Smoke detection is important. It saves lives. Um, yeah, but hopefully they'll fix it. Okay, so uh, so a few things. Uh, I mentioned this in announcements, but uh, first off, one. Um, so today normally would be a film viewing day, all right? If you've looked in the syllabus, you'll see it's a film viewing day. The way that typically worked is that I rented out the Robarts Media Commons, and then we went in as a class, and we sat in the cushy seats, and overhead projector and the whole shebang. Some people would smuggle in some snacks, ideally not ones that are too crunchy. Clearly we can't do that this year. So I managed to source links for a bunch of the films that we're looking at over the course of the year. Uh, you'll see that in a couple of weeks, we're looking at Marwin Call. I have a free streaming link for that for you. 
Um, but I had a really hard time with these films, I suspect because they were sort of large commercial films. Now, uh, at the 11th hour, um, I basically decided that, uh, that I was going to give up. And then kindly, I was contacted by um, Jeff Newman, uh, the new college librarian who did slip me a link to Black Swan. So uh, I'm not going to say too much about either of those things tonight because I want to give people a chance to watch them. I do recommend you watch them. Okay, so, so the films in question are Batman Begins and Black Swan. You can watch either one, hypothetically, if you wish. If you've already seen one, then watch the other one. If you've not seen either of them, it's a coin toss. If you have the time, watch both. I mean, they're both really quite good films. Um, and uh, if you've seen both already, watch one or both again. But this time, like, take notes, right? Um, the idea being, and again, I don't want to overframe this, but both films are, you could think of them as being sort of uh, visually dramatized and psychologically dramatized versions of shadow work, okay? And, uh, you know, for, for Black Swan, I think that's considerably more evident for people in a, in a certain sense. Um, something about the comic book framing of Batman Begins tends to, to throw people. But actually, if anything, Batman Begins is much blunter uh, about it uh, at the end of the day. Like, if you're really listening, I mean, there's, there's straight up a scene that talks about Jungian archetypes. So if you think of it in those terms, okay, and if you consider these films within sort of the, the framework of individuation that we've been talking about, right, the idea of shadow work, digging into one shadow, right, confronting one shadow, right? And also um, the idea of sort of the assumption of the archetype and, and projection, which we'll talk about a bit today. Watch these films, take some notes, okay? Watch one, watch both. And bear in mind that uh, the films in question, um, you know, there's a limited subset of creative works that your first paper may be based on. Uh, so The Wizard of Oz, which is a listed text, is one of them. Marwin Call, the documentary that we're going to watch in a couple weeks, is one of them. Um, and uh, these two films also uh, are in the mix. So, um, you know, there are a limited subset of things that your first essay is supposed to be on. I constrain that a little bit. Um, but these are among those. So if you have not seen them, watch them. Uh, if you need to pick one, pick one. Um, they're both, they're both quite good and watch them with an archetypal sort of eye. Okay. So that's just chart. Um, and, and I'll give you some time to watch it before I start posting a bunch of, um, analytical kind of notes on it, uh, because I don't want to ruin things. Um, okay. So there's that. And what's the other thing? Ah, presentations start next week. So when I get the link from the presenters who may want to reach out to me, right? Once they've got their video presentation, I will link that up. Video presentations are, relatively speaking, required viewing. So there will be a participation component attached to them, both in the form of the discussion board participation, which is standard part of discussion for the week. Um, and great job on discussion, folks. I, I've seen lots of good back and forth, lots of cool commentary, lots of good engagement. So that's really awesome to see. Um, yeah. So there will be, of course, that, but also I include a component on each presentation which uh, allows for peer feedback. Um, just because I think it's sort of important to get peer feedback. All of that feedback is anonymized, which is to say that you offer your feedback. I can tell who's offered feedback. So if you're being a jerk, I know you're being a jerk. So the idea is constructive criticism, right? Um, and constructive criticism can mean praise too, right? Um, but, you know, things you like, things you didn't, you'll see, it's structured. It's it basically, it's a bit like filling out a quiz. You offer a few comments, et cetera. And the idea is to give some feedback on people's video presentations, right? What did you think about them? Um, and that is one of the factors also that will count into your participation. So you really do need to watch these. I expect that people will. They're a core component of the course, right? So, um, so for the presenters for next week, I don't have that list in front of me, uh, unfortunately. but um, I'll probably reach out to both of you and just uh, um, and just check in uh, for next week. I see lots of single presenters, which is interesting. Historically speaking, presentation stuff um, has been in duos, but uh, I wager that some of that, of course, uh, it occurs to me, is about the difficulty of collaborating with video 
right, and presentations across distance. In fact, that's not that hard to do for what it's worth. Um, it's not as hard as it seems, but I can understand why that might be the case. In any event, it's good. We have a, we have a nice distribution of people and topics. Um, and if you haven't picked a topic yet, pick a topic, because I'm going to close that thing off fairly soon. Okay, so th there is a time window in which you must do this, um, which is to say that I'm going to close it off basically uh, before Monday. Okay, probably Sunday. Um, so tell you what, I'll give you until Monday. That will have been a full week. If for whatever reason you didn't get in there immediately, you need to get in there and sign yourself in. Okay. Because if you don't, you're going to, you know, I mean, you're already sort of picking and choosing. The other thing is, you know, in the event that you wanted to collaborate with somebody, right? Some, somebody has got a topic, they're a singleton in there or whatever. Um, you can reach out to them and, um, you know, and, and do so. If for whatever reason you can't uh, get in touch with them somehow, because I know that the messaging system is designed to clamp down on some of that stuff these days. Uh, so in the event you can't do that, message me, send me your email, I'll pass them your email with your message, um, which might be of the form like, hello, I noticed you have a topic that I would like. Here is my offering, um, such that you will partner with me. Okay, so make sure you get signed up. Okay, I think that's all the logistic -y things. So let's jump back uh, once again to <clears throat> uh, where is it? Here it is. Okay, so we are uh, jumping back into no, we're jumping back into uh, into uh, this particular material. There we go. Okay, so. Um, so we talked about the collective unconscious. We talked about the unconscious generally, right? Um, we've talked, uh, you know, a little bit about, um, and, and really just in an introductory sense, right? The, the ego, the shadow, and the persona last week. So that is to say, right, the center of consciousness, um, the sort of the, the material that it rejects in some important sense, and then the persona, the mask right? The interface with, with the outside world and the social mask. Um, and about the way that it's, uh, you know, sort of um, simultaneously is, is in some sense imposed upon people, but also is a way that they, um, it's, it's a choice that they make, right? Um, that they, a way that they choose to present themselves. One thing that I did want to say actually about persona very quickly, which I didn't say last week was, it's important to think about persona, and this comes up because we're going to talk about the contrasexual soul image, anima and animus. Um, it's important to consider the kind of dual aspect of persona, okay? And that's that in a Heideggerian kind of way, for those of you who are, are uh, philosophy wonks, uh, it simultaneously conceals and reveals. The persona simultaneously conceals and reveals. Okay, what does that mean? So think about clothing. Clothing are, is an interesting expression, okay, of, of the persona. It's, it's an interesting way that we set this up. Now, clearly in most conditions and most cultural conditions and most relationships, you are required to have some amount of clothing. Okay, obviously, depending on your family and cultural background or the level of intimacy within your partnership or whatever, you may shed clothing um, fairly liberally under other conditions, right? Some people don't care for clothes and, you know, like it's true, they're not part of our body. Um, they are, they're a piece of cyborg technology that we're all used to, but most of us are wearing clothes. Okay. Under any, many conditions. And obviously it's the case that clothes, right, plug into um, that um, social role component. So, right, one needs to dress the part for certain things. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's the case that of course there are some jobs that literally require you to have a kind of a ceremonial outfit, right? You can't be a judge or a lawyer, uh, in Canada without having robes, right? Robes are a requirement. Um, of course, robes are also a professorial requirement, um, but they've been largely shed except under ceremonial contexts. Right, so you'll see them at convocation, uh, things like that, official sort of ceremonies, but very few people, of course, still lecture in their robes. You'll still see um, religious functionaries, right, wearing their 
robes. But it, but it goes more than that, right? Even if you, you know, as a lawyer are not wearing robes, odds are you're wearing a suit, right? Business people, you know, take a stroll around Bay Street at some point, and you're going to see a lot of suits and ties, right? You look at, um, you know, dignitaries at a political function, you're going to see a lot of suits and ties. Like there are certain kinds of expectations, right? Weddings, funerals, right? There is a degree of formality that is expected um, in those places. Um, you know, likewise, right, there are certain sorts of outfits that we associate with other kinds of professional roles, right? Doctors and nurses, for instance. We expect to be dressed in a certain way. Police officers, you know, it it's, would be strange, right? If somebody just walked up off the street and they were, you know, they would be like undercover or planes clothes. It would be strange. But for a standard officer, we expect them to be in a uniform, military, right? So the point is that there are these various social roles that come with the clothes, but it's finer grained even than that, right? Social cliques come with certain kinds of codes. So, you know, um, a story that I sometimes tell, right, is, is this story about uh, when I joined a subculture in high school and it chafed. And the subculture was that I was a goth for like two weeks uh, in high school. And because I like black and vampires are cool, I guess. And um, I found, uh, well, not I guess, they're, they're neat. And, uh, uh, and I have extremely broad musical taste, so I didn't have any problems per se with listening to, you know, Joy Division and Susie and the Banshees and Bauhaus and The Cure. I like all those things. Um, but what I found was that it was overly restrictive, right? The dress code was overly restrictive, the music code, the persona was overly restrictive um, for me. So, okay, so you get these social roles, but notice how people also reveal themselves through their clothing. So th there's assumptions about concealment, right? Clothing is designed to conceal us. Yes, it keeps us warm, but it's not just that, right? And, and there are clear social codes around this. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? You think about Victorians getting all a flutter at the sight of a woman's ankle, right? And it's because the ankle was covered. Likewise, lots of cultures, right? They cover the hair, the hair becomes quite, highly charged and eroticized because it isn't part of the public sphere. It's concealed, it's private, right? Um, you know, similarly, okay, when I was about 13 or 14, Canada changed its laws on toplessness, right? And prior to that, right, it had been legal for men to be topless in public and illegal for women to be topless in public. And the Supreme Court overturned that because it was obviously, obviously preposterous. Now, the fact that people get bent out of shape about women's breasts, period, seems strikingly strange and distorted to me. Like, it's to me, it's the sign that there's something seriously off in our culture, right? That we, we have very little tr control trouble around watching people get shot in media or stabbed in media. But we, we get, you know, intensely worried about children seeing nipples, despite the fact that women's nipples are a source of nutrition for babies all around the globe for all of history and they're just a natural part of the body, but because they're concealed in our culture, they're eroticized, right? Okay, so in 13 or 14, the law gets overturned. And what happens is that female toplessness becomes legal. Okay, now I grew up on the, the peninsula in, in Grey Bruce. Um, and so, you know, I lived relatively close to Sobel Beach, quite good beach, used to go out there fairly often. And I remember when they passed this law thinking naively in my 13 or 14 year old mind that this was going to be the greatest summer of my life. Why? Because, because finally, you know, all the shirts would be off, right? But that's not what happened. It's not what happened. <laughs> People didn't suddenly, right? What you saw was in many ways, the same basic distribution as there had always been. Men often walked around toplessly, in some cases, really frankly, when they ought not to. Um, I, I have uh, little desire uh, to, to see most men's uh, nude torsos, to be quite frank. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, was there a massive wave of toplessness? No, there wasn't. There was a few people who pushed the boundaries, who might have pushed the boundaries in any event. But, like, there wasn't a massive adoption. Now think about that for a second, because this is a case where the culture code lags behind the legal code. And you'll see that sometimes the legal code, which is sort of logically derived, philosophically derived, right, from certain sets of values, isn't in the same place as the culture code. And the culture code is what held back in this case. There wasn't 
a massive surge of, of toplessness, right? Now, you can think about other cases where, for instance, straight up public nudity, so pride parade, traditionally is one of these places where, right, we all kind of back off and a little bit like uh, festival or, or something of that ilk, Mardi Gras, we just decide to license a degree of public nudity and licentiousness and sexuality that normally would be, right, make, make things a little uptight in Toronto the good. So, you know, Pride Parade, you can go and you can walk and, you know, there are people, uh, they're letting it in, uh, hang in glory. Um, and that, you know, within that framework is okay. So, persona. So think about the way that the, the culture code demands that we conceal things, okay? And then think about the way that our choices in clothing reveal things. We use our clothes to cover ourselves up, but also to say things about ourselves. They simultaneously conceal and they reveal, right? They are a mode of expression. And for people that are very into that, they understand that. It's a language of self-expression. It's effectively speaking sort of art, which is where you get things like high fashion, right? And lots of people, myself included, who look at high fashion often like, I don't think those are clothes. Like she's walking and she has like several orbit rings around her and like that doesn't seem, but the point is that it's not, it's not clothing in that sense. It happens to be on a person, but it's art right, in many cases, although sometimes there's a cascade there for people who are fashionistas where that stuff does eventually sort of work into the fast fashion public lines, but the point is, okay, it's expressive. So our clothes conceal and they reveal, right, and they simultaneously conceal and reveal. Similarly, other aspects of the persona do the same thing. When we emphasize one aspect of the persona, we are concealing things about ourselves and revealing other things. We're being selective in our presentation. It's usually the case that the persona that we put on, it's not that it has no relationship to the ego, right? If, it, if it's sort of totally different than the ego, then usually there's, there's quite a, um, a strong and unpleasant split going on for people. It has some relationship, but it, it filters relatively selectively right? So it conceals aspects of the ego and certainly aspects of the shadow, right? Keeps those things out of the public forum and the public eye, but allows people to express in other ways. Some that are mandated by social codes, but some that are about saying who they are. Um, another interesting example of this, and we'll talk more about this as we go. I don't want to lose too, too much time to this, but um, of course, I have been fascinated to see the rise um, of the tattoo culture, right? Over the course of my lifetime, really. Um, so tattoos when I was a child were uncommon. You would see them in, you know, military persons, right? So my, my uh, grandfathers both had tattoos from the war, from World War II. Um, of course, they were in naval tradition. You saw them with bikers, right? Um, and, you know, they were often associated with sort of t t toughness and outsider status, right? Sailors, bikers, prison culture, right? Tattoos were uncommon, comparatively speaking, when I was a child. But they gradually gained more and more status, now to the point when I would say that they are very nearly anyway for a generation of majority case. And I know more people with tattoos than without. I have no tattoos. This is something we'll talk about later. And I do periodically have an interest in getting one, but that, that marking of my flesh in a permanent way to make an expressive choice I understand you have to get over the bump with the first one. That's what everybody tells me. And then after that, it becomes sort of vaguely addictive or something. Um, but the point is that, right, it's that conceal reveal aspect. Uh, one of the questions is like, who do I want to make this privy to? Like, I don't want to put a spider on my face or something. But, you know, am I getting something that's like, you know, the bottom of my calf or, you know, my forearm or, right? This is questions about who I am concealing and revealing to. And then it's a question of character. What is it that I want to reveal, right? Symbolically, linguistically, pictorially. I've been fascinated by the rise of language tattoos, far more writing on people these days, um, far more writing on people generally. Clothing has much more writing. Um, and inexpensive clothing often has a lot of writing on it, uh, which is sort of an interesting fact. Expensive clothing seldom has writing on it. Um, so if you consider it really high end clothing seldom has writing on it, it tends to be, you know, patterned or whatever, but um, having words on your clothes um, is, is typically inexpensive clothing for whatever reason. Um, 
and having tattoos that say things, right, has become more and more and more common as time has passed. So anyway, another interesting example, right, ways that people are, are using persona, using the framework of, of what is revealed to reveal things about their inner character. Okay. Right. So I've now used like 15 minutes to talk about that you'll forgive me, but I wanted to add it in because it's important because the next piece we're going to talk about is the contrasexual soul image. So when we're discussing the contrasexual soul image, we're talking about in the orthodox version, okay, sort of two aspects, right? For men, the idea is that there is an inner feminine principle, an inner woman called the anima, okay? And for women, there is an inner masculine presence, right? An inner man, uh, called the animus, okay? And the idea is that um, that you've got one or the other, right? There is a certain amount of biological essentialism, okay, behind Jung, um, sort of, because he also acknowledges hermaphrodism, right? Because the mystic hermaphrodite is an extremely important archetypal figure. But the point is that at the sort of the, the basic biological categorical level, he's looking at, he's thinking in terms of men and, and women, right? And the idea being that, that you have a compensatory um, aspect, which retreats into the unconscious. Now, you know, those of you who have some familiarity with sort of fetal development and biological development, know that the fetus begins in a very nearly undifferentiated state. Essentially speaking, we all begin female, um, right? Obviously there are genetic chromosomal differences, right? Um, with XY chromosomes, but, um, but in terms of sort of our morphology, um, we're essentially, we start female and then our, our morphology goes from, from there, right? And you know, sort of at the, at the core in some ways of the animus and the animus, the idea that in a sense, our psyche could develop either way, could develop male or could develop female. So the way that it develops, it develops in one direction, right, um, into the world, but then it develops the other direction into the inner life, or it develops one way into the outer world, but then in the compensatory direction into the inner life, right, into the inner world. Okay which is why I wanted to place this stress on persona because in the diagram that we're using, I'll just flash back to it real quick so that for your reference. Okay. In the diagram that we're using, you'll see that, right? Yes. Yeah, self is the, the pivot point to the psyche. Ego and shadow operate in this compensatory fashion, right? And then persona and animus anima are in counterpoint. Okay. So, what does that mean? Well, if the persona is this mediating factor, right, between the individual and the external collective, okay, um, into, into sort of the outer world, the contrasexual soul image, the animus or anima has a comparable uh, function in the inner life. Now that's harder to understand, right? But it has to do with its, its if the persona is sort of the interface point, okay? And it's interface, right? There's ex information exchange across both, but it's, it's necessary. It's necessary to have it, right? Not having persona developed typically is not a good thing. Having an inflexible, totally inflexible and fixed persona is often strange, right? Um, it, we, it typically th throws us as being very unusual. We expect people to have this interface point. And people sometimes strive not to have it, right? We have a strong cultural value around authenticity. But really, even authenticity is, um, you know, involves typically a certain amount of socially appropriate filtering. Um, I said to somebody once, I was in a conversation with somebody after a conference and they were something of a proponent of um, radical honesty. I had not slept well in several days because that's what running a conference is like. And uh, um, so they were sort of talking about radical honesty and I um, was a bit short tempered. Uh, and I said, I, gotta, I have to you know, be, uh, be honest myself and say that virtually every case of radical honesty I've ever come across just seemed like an excuse for somebody to be an asshole, which was how I felt about it, right? That many of the cases of radical honesty that I encounter are people being blunt or cruel and then somehow defaulting as though they're 
you know, expressing virtue. Well, I'm just expressing honesty as though virtues, you know, don't have a variable hierarchy by context or something, right? No, no, it's, it's just honesty. Mm, no, it's possible to be too honest in some sense, right? It's possible to be too honest. You know, it's possible to not have a filter and to hurt people's feelings unnecessarily so, to say things that are counterproductive and so on and so forth, or to share aspects of your inner life, you know, in contexts that aren't appropriate, right? And, and there really are moments where things are less and more appropriate, right? You can't just necessarily blurt out every aspect of your inner life to somebody when you meet, right? Okay, so the persona has that function it's an interface, it's an interface, it's a mediation, okay, with the outer world. Correspondingly, the animus or anima does the same on the inner world. Now, the idea that it's an inner man or inner, inner woman, okay, if you really look at, at, at Jung's notion, the idea is like, what happens essentially speaking is that the gender traits which are biological, associated with your biological sex, kind of in Jung, are gonna tend to float into the persona, right? So, and bearing in mind, right, he's in the, you know, the end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. So the idea is that, you know, among the other things in my persona, right, are going to be gendered things, right? And you can see how this is, right? Um, you know, obviously there's more variability in this area than there, than there used to be, right? People are playing in the space more. Um, and I actually think that that's a really um, uh, interesting and significant, okay, cultural shift. The people are playing in that space more. Um, you know, although there have always been versions of that in culture, virtually every culture has some, some aspect of that. And we'll come around to some of that stuff. But the point is like, for the most part, there are certain kinds of culture codes on how gendered, um, on how gendered material works its way into the persona and not just into the persona, but also correspondingly into the ego. So, right, when you, when you, um, you know, attempt to behave in a masculine fashion deliberately, and people do all the time, you know, man up, right, is a thing people say, for instance, or, um, you know, strong and silent or whatever, like people have ideas, right? Men and women and, right? People have ideas about what constitutes masculinity and femininity. And the idea is that there's a fair bit of pressure, but also a certain amount of internal, um, sort of internal reward for doing those things, right? So, so there's an external pressure to behave in certain ways, but also the culture, of course, rewards in the form of attention and in the form of praise and in the form of whatever. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, that can, it can cut both ways, obviously, right? So like, it's no, uh, uh, it's no mystery to um, any women in the class, right? That the male gaze can be, you know, a, a bizarre and oppressive phenomenon, right? Anybody who's been sort of, you know, like whistled at or whatever, um, I obviously am not a woman and I don't identify as a woman. I have been whistled at uh, when I was younger, Svelter um, had a handlebar mustache and uh, used to hang out in the village sometimes. Um, I had friends that lived near there and uh, I periodically got whistled at. And I will say that initially speaking, um, being, being whistled at was um, frankly flattering. Um, but then after a while, it was strangely demoralizing and I felt... Um, well, it was weird, right? I mean, I, I felt like a piece of meat, which is the thing that you always say. It's like, uh, uh, you're right. You're not really paying attention to me as an individual, right? And, but mixed together with this strange welter of like, oh, but you know, it's like, it's nice to have somebody be appreciated. No, thank you. Uh, but, um, but, um, but thank you. Right. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of that tied in, in that sense, right? With, with gendered assessment, there are upsides and downsides right? Upsides and downsides. And, and the fact goes, that's for lots of things, right? You know, being in a traditionally male persona stance carries with it, you know, a bunch of frankly dumb shit in our culture, right? So it's far more difficult for many men in our culture to access their emotions, right? In a, in a general sense. And in particular, to access sadness. Um, it's 
far, far, and I'm saying this both statistically speaking and uh, you know, anecdotally based on my clinical experience, but it's much harder for many men to cry than it is for women. And crying, I mean, that's just a straight up natural function. Now, some of that, right, is that we, we um, <laughs> effectively sort of slam this out of children by saying, don't cry, be grown up, don't cry, as though there's some correlation between the ability to cry and being grown up, right? And obviously, self-regulation matters to adulthood, but the idea that, right, when people lose, they lose their contact with this, and they don't realize how much of a wound it is, because as often as not, they treat it as a virtue. I don't cry. I never cry. Ugh, really? Because that's a very basic biological expression of an emotional state. It's a central state. There are things to cry about, right? you know, at the right time and in the right place. But that's hard. It's hard for, for many men to get to if they are sort of traditionally masculine. Obviously, it's hard for lots of people to get to under other conditions. The flip side is that there are, I mean, aside from loads of sort of, you know, um, uh, cultural benefits, right, to masculinity, but there, there are things that go with it, right? Like sometimes it feels good to inhabit the role. In the same way as for women, right, if they, if they choose to express at some time, right, a relatively traditional form of femininity in one way or another, sometimes it feels gross and yucky and constraining to be forced into that, right? Like when somebody says, you should smile more or wear a dress or whatever. But then sometimes if, you know, one throws a dress on, um, then all of a sudden they feel quite good. Now, not to say that men can't throw dresses on. Dresses are terrible on me. And every time I've ever worn them, also I have size 13 feet, so my ability to wear heels is sharply limited. Um, <laughs> not, not that I haven't tried a few times, I have, um, and stumbled around on them. They're, they're remarkable things. Anyway, so leaving that aside. Um, so what's the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making is that, right, a lot of the that gendered material, if it's sort of in line with the external conscious physical presentation is going to tend to float up into the persona. And correspondingly, the opposite material attaches to the contrasexual soul image. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because it means that no matter what your cultural formulation is of this division, okay? And no matter how complicated a gender system you get, typically in a civilization, there is typically some kind of basic sense around that kind of division, if for no other reason than sort of reproductive, right? Um, reproductive ideas. Now, that can be more complex, and I certainly, I don't want to undercut the complexity of um, the anthropological literature in this area, because it, it can be quite complex. But relatively speaking, right, there is a sense of a dyadic kind of principle, right? And I think forming opposites is a really central human conscious thing, regardless of what the opposites are. So in, you know, in Western culture, right, this stuff moves around, but there has been a certain kind of polarization. And so some of those traits in the polarization float up into the persona, where they become part of whatever. And then the opposite tend to precipitate down into the soul image. Okay, why does that matter? Because it means that at some level, right, that the inner figure who provides the gatekeeping function, right, and the psychopomp function, okay, psychopomp is a, um, a being capable of crossing between worlds. So like many birds are considered to be psychopomps, so whippoorwills and uh, crows and ravens and sparrows, right, are, are considered to be uh, psychopomps. And psychopomps often are responsible for taking the souls of the dead to the underworld or the afterlife so they can pass between worlds that have a kind of like a shamanic um, guide quality, okay? And the contrasexual soul image likewise has this quality. It is the outstretched hand, the inner figure of the outstretched hand that both mediates, right, with our, with our personal um, consciousness and stuff, right? But also brings us deeper into the collective unconscious. It's, it's the gatekeeper on stuff. And the way that that shows up in myths and fairy tales and uh, dreams is generally as a figure of, you know, the opposite sex. Now, I'm talking in orthodox Jungian terms because this is a, a much more contested space, obviously. 
Um, I know a bunch of queer analysts who have sort of interesting ideas about the possibility that we each have, you know, both, or I think that the model that I have, this differentiation model, does work. It's sort of incidental in a way, okay, that 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 traits are sort of gender and sex dependent. Theoretically, it could just be about any kind of differentiation between the persona and the inner life. It just happens that usually, right, the persona includes gendered kinds of ideas, and so therefore, so does a contrasexual soul image. That's how I specifically look at it, because it sort of escapes the specificity of trying to nail down some kind of like you know, um, essentialism that I don't think is well supported in the literature. However, in the orthodox system, you know, it's, uh, it's more sort of cut and dry than that. So, okay, so in myths and fairy tales and dreams then, um, women will have a masculine inner figure, a man, an inner man, and men will have an inner woman. Now the thing is, and this is where it's particularly important, it's not just in those conditions. So, of course, love stories are all about, right, in a, in a Jungian analysis, love stories are all about um, ego and soul, right? That's, that's the whole point of them. And encountering these things in a dream, right? So, you know, you have a dream about, um, you know, a lover, and, you know, looking at it in terms of uh, the general category, right, um, is, is often quite useful, right? that there is um, an, a kind of acquired amalgam. And so, you know, for men, for instance, right, who is the first woman in their life? Their mother. And then possibly, right, they have female siblings or other kinds of female relatives. And those sort of add into the, the field. They add into the, um, the complex in some sense. And then they have, right, significant early reactions, you know, classmates, right? people that they have a crush on, the first people that they date, their first lover, their first significant relationship, the, their spouse, the mother of their children, and then, right, in turn, possibly, their own female children. And all of those things, along with coworkers and friends, and, and of course, also media images, which uh, have a huge impact on religious images, are all going to go into this amalgam about femininity. And you can see that that is a bigger container, for instance, than just mother. Mother is its own kind of archetypal image, but remember I said the map isn't the territory, right? There are blurry boundaries. That general umbrella of the feminine is going to contain a bunch of other things, right? The classic way of expressing this in the old school for, for the feminine triad is mother, maiden, and crone, which is kind of a, a pagan idea, right? So, um, or maiden, mother, and crone. We want to get that in sequence. So maiden is, um, you know, vir virginal, you know, young, fresh, spring-like, whatever. Mother is um, fertile, possibly pregnant, right? Um, is a sort of summer, is, right? Com coming into fullness, maturity, et cetera, right? And crone, <laughs> unfortunately named crone, um, is typically, you know, older, barren, um, you know, but also wise. And you see versions of this turn up with like witch triads, right? That's a pretty classic cultural version. But the point is, all of these different aspects are under, they're unified under this kind of general feminine principle that informs, in some sense, people's experience of the feminine, right, within themselves, but also within the world. Same thing with men, or sorry, with women, right? That there are inner masculine figures. And we're going to unpack this a lot more, but I want to Again, this is overview. So the thing is that encountering it within a dream or encountering it within a fairy tale or encountering it within a myth or whatever, yes, that's one area where you might encounter it. However, much more common, okay, than, than those, if you're looking at things in Jungian terms, are two other phenomena, projection and relatedness. Both of those are the province of the soul, okay, in some important sense. Now, projection. What's projection? Well, if you've ever had the experience of love at first sight, okay, then you've experienced extremely powerful projection. Love at first sight, um, if you've never had it, uh, I mean, this can be sort of hard to understand. It's, kind of, it's a bit of a madness, but of course you've seen depictions of it. But if you've ever had it, if you've ever experienced it, and I have been lucky and or unlucky 
enough to experience it in my life on a number of occasions um, where I have um, met somebody and immediately found myself swept up. And in some cases, because there was some kind of immediate simpatico, right? Not because, but there was some kind of immediate simpatico. You know, we really hit it off. We wandered around till two in the morning, Queens Key. We felt like we had known each other forever. Like there was just this immediate powerful thing, right? And at, at a bunch of levels, you know, sort of physical attraction, intellectual attraction, emotional attraction, et cetera, right? And reciprocally, not always reciprocally. You can totally have love at first sight and have it be unrequited. And this is intensely painful, um, right? Uh, but in some cases, right, it was... Uh, yeah, it was just like this immediate striking thing. And in fact, maybe in some cases where there was not, uh, when, when I really looked at it uh, later, all that much simpatico. Okay, so, so what do I mean? So if you've had that experience, love at first sight, right? You wander around, you stay up until three in the morning, you feel like you've known each other forever, you feel like soulmates, it feels like destiny. There is a kind of like cult of two, that comes about if it's reciprocal, this field of mutually accelerating disclosure. But here's the thing, you don't know them. You don't. The amount of data that you've got in the time that you, you know, have had the love at first sight experience and it's progressed, you don't actually know them. Not really, right? And of course people fall into this trap a lot, right? They'll launch themselves into a relationship and then find out that it is not what they thought it was. So if it wasn't what they thought it was, then what were they interacting with? And the answer is that they're interacting with their projection. It's them. Now the person, of course, you know, a projection always needs hooks. It always needs something to hang on. And that might be a matter of resemblance. There might be certain key traits and things, but then they fill in the gaps and they fill it in with this projection. And that can, can cause these incredibly powerful um, states to occur, right? So it's not uncommon for people to talk about uh, a new love when they've experienced love at first sight and talk about it in terms of perfection, right? But no human being is perfect. That is a short route to disappointment. And that perfection comes in two styles. And I don't wanna, again, I don't wanna overgeneralize, but if I was going to, to broadly hand wave and generalize, I would say that more often, um, when I talk to men who have fallen into this projective state, um, they will say things, and it's not invariable, but they will say things like, um, she's perfect, she's perfect in every way, right? And then, uh, uh, and then as time goes on, they start to wear holes in the projection and they start to see the human being under and, and then they're mad often or disgusted or pissed off or whatever. Oh, what? A human? Like, this isn't the goddess I signed up for. Uh, whereas... Uh, a lot of the time, it seems that when I've spoken with women in the same sort of field, um, they can see the flaws. Um, so they're like, oh, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. But I'll fix those things, is what I hear a lot, right? And there is this idea that it's like, oh, yeah, I can see clearly what's wrong, but I'll fix it. Their perfection exists in a, in a perspective, projective fashion, right? They're going to bring it into being. Of course, both are wrong. Uh, it's very seldom the case that that uh, either the original projection doesn't get holes worn in it or that you succeed in doing a fixer upper project on another human being. It doesn't work like that. And then people are disappointed, right? And sometimes when the projection starts to fade off, people are left feeling really deflated, depressed even, right? Um, because they feel like they're they're losing access to a kind of magic that swept them away. I and mean, it is magical. Um, it doesn't always make especially good decisions for us. And so there is a question when you start to become relatively adept with your own sort of projections and so on and so forth, which is, well, if you just let the projection roll, right? If you just let the projection roll, you're probably in for a roller coaster and some real emotional pain. If you've done it a few times, you get familiar with it. But if you completely claw back the projection, then you pull all the magic out, right? Because that's where the sense of like enchantment and the flutter and all that stuff, if you just constantly pull your projection, claw your projection back, right? Then all of that goes away. Um, now I will say that, um, you know, when Jung talks about shadow work as being um, 
the apprentice piece and the uh, sort of soul work as being the journeyman piece, right? One of the reasons he's saying that is that shadow work is comparatively quite simple. It's easy to access. It really is. It doesn't seem like it sometimes when you're getting into it, but really it's right there. It's ready at hand. You have it right here. In fact, it often, right in the middle of the night, you know, if you've maybe had a little too much to drink or you haven't got enough sleep or you just had a bad day, your shadow material can come out of the bushes like a tiger in the rain, right? And get right on top of you. Um, not that that's necessarily bad, right? Um, you know, uh, as I was saying to uh, um, somebody a little while ago, um, our culture, for instance, has uh, entirely too much sort of de-emphasis on, say, the bad trip. You know, when people like uh, take uh, uh, mushrooms and it doesn't go especially well, or they, um, you know, eat too many edibles and they go into a terrible introspective loop. Sometimes that stuff's just living hell and it's trauma. But sometimes what it does is forcibly pull skeletons out of the closet and force us to look at them. Like, and as a moral experience, of course, it's a descent into, into pain, right? Anyway, the point is shadow work. It's relatively easy to get at. When you start to get into the relatedness and projective functions, okay, that surround the, the soul image, um, it opens up a whole can of worms. Now, there is a corresponding projection for shadow, actually, before we get into that, which is, of course, hate at first sight. So if you've met somebody and you just instantly detest them, the same thing is true. You don't know them. You don't know them. They might have some kind of minor trait, a hook, again, that you are hanging that your reaction on. Oh, I hate people who X, okay? But you're definitely generalizing. Like, whatever that X trait is, you don't know enough about them to make that assessment. Certainly not if they hate them, right? Hate, it's so strong. But people will hate people. They'll just hate them. And I know because I've experienced this. When I took this young course many moons ago, uh, there was a fellow that sat down from me and, uh, and every time he spoke, I would grit my teeth. Like it just it made me crazy just to listen to him. And he would talk about things and they were all things that I was interested in and knew about. But when he brought them up, I would think to myself, oh yeah, like, you know, Mr. Smarty Pants knows about whatever, like big deal. I've read that book, right? Now, luckily I was doing a course on Jungian psychology and also I read Jung a lot. And so it didn't take me very long to pick up that this was pretty obviously a shadow projection. And so I went to him at the end of class uh, after a few months of this. I mean, he used to go home from this class and, and bitch to my flatmates. Because that fucking guy was talking again. Anyway, I went to him at the end of class and I said like, hey, I'm Anderson Todd. Do you want to go get a beer? And the reason being that the fact that I was shadow projecting in that way, that hate at first sight factor, right, was shadow projection. Um, I wasn't interacting with the individual. And my general, my general uh, experience is that if you take the time to really get to know somebody and to listen, right, you will cut through the projection, the projection will dissolve. And indeed, that person is, is among my best friends. He's a great guy. And it, it's not lost on me that a bunch of the traits that he was projecting are traits that I possess, but do not particularly care in myself. The traits that I was getting irritated about, right? You know, frankly being, you know, like a bit of a know-it-all and right being, um, I don't know, like a, a bit culturally fringy and right. These were moves he was making. And to some extent that was probably like, I was feeling territorially threatened or something. But the point was, there are also things that I don't love about myself. I don't, right? being a yappy know-it-all is like a postural thing that makes me feel kind of yucky. When I still took classes, I, you know, given the opportunity, I'm one of those guys that talks a lot. You probably already guessed that, you know, I would talk quite a bit, you know. Um, so I used to quite deliberately limit myself because it's like, it doesn't, doesn't do, doesn't do, you know, to suck all the air out of the room kind of thing. And I was quite conscious of it. So here's this guy, he's making these comments, shadow projection. You can see how that fits together, right? Okay, so that's the corresponding hate at first sight. But when you're talking about projections around anima, you're, you're often talking in romantic terms. And we've only got five minutes left, so I guess I have to bump the self into the next thing. I see I am too talky. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about a couple of instances of projection. 
Okay, so um, so there are the general sort of romantic instances of projection. I've experienced kind of, you know, a bunch of those. But there was a case in, in my 20s, I was deep enough in, into Jung, that I decided I was done with being kind of messed around with by my, um, by my anima. I was done with being screwed around with by these images. Basically, I'd been burned enough times that I was like, I need to get this under control, okay? So based on my Jungian reading at the time, I decided on a particular program. I was going to dissolve projections, pull them back, okay? And it, so try to catch them, dissolve them, pull them back. And at the same time, I was going to undertake um, conscious actions that drew from things that I found specifically feminine, right, as a way of bringing that energy in myself. I was trying to sort of like fast track my inner marriage, okay? So pulling those projections back from the world, not allowing them to settle on humans, right? And simultaneously, right, trying to express those energies myself. So one thing that I did during the time period was, um, I, I um, well, a couple things. One, I had masculine material, really, which comes on my dad around ambition and money and worldliness, right? This idea of like participating in the world in an ambitious way. My father was an ambitious man, is, I guess, an ambitious man, was an ambitious man. And my father was quite materially concerned, right? Had a bumper sticker, he who has the most toys when he dies wins, right? Which I would think about now and be like, no, because he's dead. The toys don't do you any good, but, right? My father was interested in money and interested in what money could get him. He wasn't avaricious, but he was definitely material, okay? So I pushed those aspects away from myself very consciously at the time, okay? And I was like, no ambition, no worldly whatever. I still had ambition because I was working writing full time, but not in the conventional sense. I was rejecting that conventional sense, okay? Rejecting this, the conventional sense of, um, you know, masculinity, uh, you know, uh, inherent in sexual conquest, which is questionable anyway. But like I pushed that away. I pushed away a bunch of these aspects of things that struck me as inherently masculine, right? And that was largely unconscious that I was doing it. But I consciously began to adopt things that I saw as feminine. So as one example of this, um, I took up baking. Okay, baking for me probably comes from my mom. My mom never did a lot of baking, but she made muffins, so go figure. But I find baking um, feminine, and, and, and I'm, you know, apologize for the stereotype, although I do plenty of baking. Um, you know, so my, if my high school girlfriend was baking, this, this made me very cuddly. Um, like I, I quite liked it. It made me feel very fond, very warm, but it also made me feel really sort of masculine, right? And so I recognized that. And so I took up baking. I started baking bread every day, every day, right? Every single day. Um, I would bake fresh bread. Part of that was poverty. So um, being able to make your own bread helps. But, you know, the point of it was I was trying to absorb these energies. Okay, short version, because we've only got two minutes left. It's a disaster. So this is referred to in the Jungian literature as the lesser conjunctio or the false conjunctio. And the idea of the conjunctio, of course, is an eventual, an eventual synthetic convergence of energies, right? So that you end up in this, this place beyond the mystic hermaphrodite, you end up right in the place of like the philosopher's stone itself, which we'll get to. But the false conjunctio is like a merging of the energies that yields a certain kind of monstrousness, okay? And the monstrousness was, I had no place undertaking this kind of integration. I had no place doing it because I hadn't properly developed conscious relationship to the energies to begin with. I hadn't consciously bothered to develop a relationship to masculinity, right? I had things. It's not that I didn't consider myself to be male or masculine, right? Um, and, and there are lots of conventional markers of that that, really care that much about, right? I, just, I cannot, for the life of me, become interested in sports. And that's a relatively conventional, you know, masculine, like there are lots of things of that form. And it's like, I don't care. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about sports. I don't care about cars. Um, you know, I didn't care about any of that. Right. But at the same time, you know, like I hadn't developed this conscious thing and I started to have an absolute flood of dreams. Okay, um, w one which involved uh, um, an angry uh, red lightning shot 
atomic bomb slash storm cloud out over a lake, right? That was angry and which I knew in the dream was masculine, okay? Um, one, uh, one of a series which involved a lake house, a dream symbol that turns up for me pretty often, um, where there was a kind of like bloodless androgyne, uh, a little bit like a really evil Tilda Swinton um, who was sort of sinister and around, right? And androgyne in the sense of like seemed sort of sexless, but in a, a sinister vampiric way. And in a way that was a kind of symbol. It's like, right, I have an underdeveloped masculine side and relationship to it and an underdeveloped feminine side. And here I am rushing into, right, the inner marriage. So I had to tease all that stuff back apart. And when you look at the false conjunctio, right, the false conjunctio, um, or, or the, the lesser conjunctio, if you want to be friendlier about it. Yeah, what you see is that the false conjunctio yields kind of monsters, right? Chimera monstrosities. The idea is that it renders us monstrous, that if there is a premature integration of forces, we don't have things developed to the extent that they need to be before they're integrated. Okay, so we're out of time in the first hour. So we're going to pause on that bit. And when we come back, I'll talk a little bit more about projection. We'll jump into the self and hopefully I leave enough time to actually talk about function theory. Okay. <laughs>